Welcome to the latest edition of the DBS webinar series, Insurance Insight, designed to give you the tools and information you need as a financial professional. Sit back as we tackle the hottest topics in life insurance, breaking industry news, and leading sales ideas to help you better understand the products and services that will help you help your clients. Now, here's your host, Kurt Fossen, Executive Vice President of Sales and Marketing. Well, hello. Welcome to another edition of Insurance Insight. My name is Kurt Fossen, Executive Vice President here at DBS, and we're glad that you took time to join us today. And today we're going to talk a little bit about Index Universal Life, the benefits of using IUL and some of the strategies that can help work to solve your client's needs. Along with this, we're going to share some exciting new product information from all from Allianz. To tackle this, I'm pleased to introduce my guest, and he's been with us before, Corey Luke. Corey is head of advanced markets and business development at Allianz Life. He has over two decades of experience in the financial services industry, and in particular has a focus on the life insurance product strategy, competitive intelligence, and illustration development efforts. That's a mouthful, Corey. You're responsible for a lot of things. I'm glad you're with us today. You're the right guy. Yeah, hey, Kurt. Absolutely. Thank you for having me and uh, very excited to be here. Well, Corey, let's get started. I think to kick things off, let's talk about that exciting news you have about your new product at Allianz. I think you told me it's called the Life Accumulator IUL. Maybe you could just share a little bit about the scope of, of this new product. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so Life Accumulator IUL launched this past July, and there's really you know two big areas of change. Uh, first uh, being that we did make some pricing changes, and so we did adjust the premium loads, look at some of the target premiums to maintain competitiveness, and then also went in and uh, looked at some of the uh, bonus uh, options that we had available. Uh, the second thing that we did was actually change um, some of the index options that are out there. We changed some of the existing indexes that have been traditionally offered by Allianz and also added some new ones uh, at the same time. And then last but not least, uh, maintaining our risk upgrade program was something that we also carried over uh, to this product. Uh, that's going to be running now until the end of September. Um, but again, very excited about the new product that launched in July. Oh, a lot that's a lot. Let's try to unpack some of that if we can. Uh, back up with me just a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more about the premium loads and the pricing change. Absolutely. Yeah. So as we talked about the premium loads, you know, changing um, from this product, from the old product, the old structure that we had on the old product was that the premium load was 8% uh, years one through nine. Uh, that premium load dropped then to 4% in years 10 plus. And for any uh, payment over the seven pay amount, we were actually charging what was called a supplemental premium load that amounted to 14%. Uh, the new premium loads, just given uh, you know a lot of what we did on kind of looking at uh, the different mechanics and what types of premium loads allowed us to achieve the required profitability, but also maintain competitiveness in the industry is where we landed with a 9% premium load in year one. So that applies to every case across the board. Uh, and then dropping to 5% in year two. And so that really did one of two things. Uh, first of all, it maintained competitiveness or improved competitiveness overall for all of the cells out there. And then secondly, allowed us to kind of open ourselves up to start attracting some of that 1035 business uh, mm -hmm. that had slowly eroded away over the last couple of years. So uh, again, those are the main pricing changes uh, that we changed. Uh, that's uh, the very very creative and, and very very wise. I'm sure you will attract some some nice 1035s with that with that change. Now let's talk about the multiple allocation options. Uh, maybe you could focus on the three new indexes you alluded to and uh, just give uh, our listeners just a little more information about what that looks like. Sure. Yeah. So the three new indexes um, that are available on this product, the first of which is replacing uh, one of the current indexes. So we replaced the blended index that we had in the past that was a capped strategy and replaced it with the blended futures strategy. Now, the big part to know about this is that mechanically speaking, it works the exact same way. Uh, but this new index is lockable. And so it is uncapped, unlike the old yeah. one that was capped. Um, has three equity components with an international flavor and a bond component with fixed percentages uh, across all of them. 
Um, but it is lockable, so it is par rate driven at the end of the day. So that's the first index. The second index is adding the S&P futures option. One of the pieces of feedback that we've got in the market is that, you know, the S&P index has really been going crazy uh, the last couple of years, uh, particularly in 2023. Uh, but all of the indexes out there that are either some kind of blended strategy or maybe a VCI, a volatility controlled index, wasn't really able to capture a lot of that upside S&P potential. The good news is the S&P futures index does just that. It is not the SBX, so it is not the actual S&P 500 that everybody's familiar with that gets reported on all the financial uh, talk shows, but it is very close. It tracks very similarly, and most important, it is lockable, and it is also uncapped. Now, it does have a participation rate, and that participation rate is not quite at uh, 100%, so it's a little bit less than that. But again, tracks very similarly uh, to the S&P 500. So we got the blended futures, the S&P futures. The third one is we actually made changes to our volatility controlled index called BUDB. Now, BUDB, as you recall, was the original VCI index in the industry. Allianz was the first carrier to come out with it back in 2014. Over the years, like anything else, we've evolved and been able to innovate. And really, the BUDB3 is what we're calling it. Uh, is just that latest innovation of kind of continuing to uh, push the VCI story forward. So again, those three new indexes, in addition to the S&P indexes that did not change, as well as the PIMCO index uh, that we've been offering for the last several years. So that's the new index lineup. Well, Corey, that's that's very interesting. Uh, to, to just reiterate just a little bit, with the lockable index lineup, there are options that can help with the knowledge of when to choose each option right you've got a crystal ball or something you hand out to people yeah right i i wish um i think that the the reality is is that everyone is trying to pick which index performs the best from year to year we actually did the analysis and over the last 13 years if you had that crystal ball and could have picked it perfectly you would have averaged north of 18 percent every year um, now, that number is 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 kind of surprising to some people, but a couple of things that go into that, one being, uh, first of all, you would have to pick a different index every year because it's never the same index year after year that's going to be the best performer. Second thing is, is that you actually would have had to go into the fixed account all in uh, with 100% of your allocation three times over the last 13 years. And so what that mm-hmm. means is the reality of all of that is that we recognize that it is very difficult, if not impossible, Uh, to pick the best index from year after year, which is why we're trying to make it easy for all of our producers working with their customers to diversify across all of the indexes. Now, again, keeping them so that all of their indexes are lockable, so kind of taking advantage of that, you know, unique Allianz feature, but really just creating those diversification strategies um, that make it real easy to be well diversified across a multitude of indexes. Uh, That's great. You know, Sometimes uh, when, when people think about these products, it's, it's kind of hard to differentiate the nuances uh, within an IUL, right? I mean, you and I have heard that before. And so I, I think maybe it makes sense for us to take just a moment. Let's talk about the different indexing options, bonus opportunities, crediting methods, all of those things wrapped together and how they really are going to be portrayed in the new accumulator product. Sure. Yeah, so the the key thing to note is that, you know, we'll start with the S&P futures. You know, again, I'll cover the first four uh, lockable options first. So the S&P futures, as we talked about, that's 100% equity index, uh, tracks very closely uh, to the SPX index, which is the annual point-to-point S&P 500. Uh, But again, it is lockable and it doesn't have a cap. And so what that means is when the market is returning 40%, you're actually going to get several instances where you're getting 15, 20, 30% as compared to a capped index, which is going to be something in the 9 to 12% range. So that's the S&P futures index. The blended futures, very similarly, but instead of it being 100% focused on one index, you've got a couple of components that kind of do a natural diversifier. So you've got the three subcomponents that allow you to uh, uh, you know, take advantage of, of some different markets uh, around the world. It's got an international flavor and a bond component uh, inside that. Then you've got the the Budby index, which is the one that we just changed. Um, that is really the traditional VCI index where it's taking a look at the uh, volatility in the market and then saying a portion of that index is, is allocated to equity 
and the other portion is allocated to cash. And so really trying to take advantage of the ups and downs in the market caused by volatility. And then last but not least, the index that we've been offering uh, for several years, uh, the PIMCO index, um, similar in the into the BUDB index and in that is volatility controlled, but the difference is that it also allocates a portion to bonds, but that allocation depends on A, the percentage that goes into the bonds, as well as the duration uh, of the bonds. And so again, there's just little different flavor for each one of them, and together, um, that's where we think that diversification is really going to allow you to take advantage of, of the ups, but also cover yourself um, with on the downs. Because as I mentioned, every single year, looking at the historical analysis of this, every single year, a different index is the top performer. So really diversification is the key to it all. Well, great. That, that That's helpful, Corey. And, you know, knowing all of this, I think what I'd like to do now is just to kind of help both myself and perhaps some of the viewers listeners out there let's let's go back in time and let's think about what allocation bonus option would have been most effective given the economic scenario of that year so why don't you start let's take uh, 2015. sure yeah it's, it's a great question kurt because 2013 and 2014 saw some of the largest returns uh and looking over the last 13 13 years well what happened in 2015 specifically uh, is that interest rates fell, first of all, at the end of 2014. Uh, and what that meant once you got into 2015 is that really volatility began to spike. Um, and so what ended up happening is that the fixed account was actually uh, the one that would have actually returned the best. As I mentioned earlier, yes, you would have averaged north of 18% had you picked it exactly three times over the last 13 years. And 2015 was simply one uh, of those options. The good news is with Allianz's product, our fixed account currently has the highest fixed account rate in the industry at 5.3%. So back in wow. 2015, when the when, when the market really kind of stalled itself out, the fixed account would have been the best option um, for your IUL customer. All right, let's go to something that uh, many of us are still trying to forget, and that was the beginning of the global disruption. And according to my math, that was about 2020. What would, what would have worked then? Yeah, well, 2020, a lot was going on uh, in that market. As you mentioned, you know, the, the, the pandemic hitting kind of in March. Um, but really what the reality is, and kind of when you're thinking about IUL, is that 2019, you really saw steady market increases. And the, the one challenge with, you know, with index IUL, you know, from year to year is that the high point is the starting point for the following year. Um, so really what would have happened in 2020 is that because you were kind of seeing a lot of momentum from 2019 moving into uh, 2020, uh, the best performing index was actually that that was able to take advantage of all of those different equity markets. And so the blended future strategy, because you had were able to take advantage of an international index as well as the uh, two indexes that are tracking um, to the U.S., but also had a bond component in there because, again, the markets really started fluctuating in certain spaces uh, coming in and out of COVID. And so, again, the blended future strategy was the one that performed the best uh, in 2020. Excellent. Well, let's just look at last year then, uh, 2023. Still some continued economic and global uncertainty. What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, it, it, exactly. And, and what was going on in 23 is, first of all, you know, 2022 was another one of those years when when you really should have gone into the fixed account because 2022 was really challenging again, coming out of what was happening in 2020. Market recovered. Uh, 2021, that was suddenly the high point. Uh, and then 2022, uh, we went a little bit backwards. Well, what happened in 2023 is really when you were kind of seeing the S&P really start to soar. And so naturally, uh, the index that performed the best was the one that was 100% equities. There is no VCI component. There's no bond component. And the S&P 500 futures index would have been the best performer. Yes, the annual point to point on the S&P would have capped itself out that year. But that's really where you were able to take advantage of the S&P futures index. And quite frankly, you would have gotten a return north of 20% uh, in that index back in 2023. So I think what I'm hearing from you then is... Um, we really, no matter how hard we try, even if you see an ad on late night TV, you cannot get a crystal ball and you can't see the future. So it's really going to be diversification. Diversification is really your friend, right? 
Absolutely. And it, it's really what I'd say just from a you know, philosophical standpoint of working with your customer, trying to chase returns or trying to pick the returns, you're really setting yourself up for failure. Uh, and, and really what this diversification strategy does is, A, it allows you that, you know, three times, you know, generally speaking, about every fourth year, all of these indexes are going to underperform. And so diversifying can, you know, really give you uh, a floor, uh, something above zero. Um, the other thing that I would say is it, it also allows you to not necessarily always be trying to swing for the fence because it's like, okay, well, I got an 18%. Well, I should be really happy about an 18%. Oh, but this index over here did 22. I should have been in that one. Uh -huh. Well, if you went into that 22, uh -huh. well, guess what? That one's not going to be the best next year. So it's almost like setting, constantly setting yourselves up for failure uh, or disappointment rather. Um, but that's where we really think diversification is that, again, you kind of even average all these out together. I talked about the averages, you know, 18% if you'd have done it year over year. When you actually take these different diversified options and simply go 25% into each one of them, your average uh, is anywhere between 10 to 13%. Now, when you're given the fact wow. that most illustrations are run at somewhere between 6 and 7 the fact that you can average somewhere between 10 and 13 and take all of the disappointment and all of the ups and downs out of it, that's where we're finding that a lot of producers are actually choosing those diversified options on the product that we just launched in July. Wow, that that's impressive. That's impressive. So, all right, let's let's pause a bit on on the specific product that that you guys are launching uh, for a moment. I want to just talk about general terms about the index universal life and the benefits for diversifying within an IE well as a really about offering protection, accumulation, and, and having flexibility. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, these are still life insurance products, right? So protection has always got to be part of it. You know, when you go through underwriting, you really need to uh, establish that death benefit. Um, but once you've established that death benefit is really where you can kind of take advantage of the accumulation and having that flexible access to your point, uh, the living benefits, so to speak, of the product. Uh, but again, this is life insurance at the end of the day. But again, the tax free nature of it is what allows you to kind of take advantage of that tax free buildup and then start taking uh, some of that in the form of distributions or loans. Um, so, yeah, it, it, there's a lot of flexibility offered on these products in the future. No doubt. Corey, as you and I were preparing for this call, you talked about uh, six diversified strategies uh, that, that really are used a lot with, with IU Wells. So maybe you could go through those with us. Yeah, absolutely. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we really found that doing some different focus groups with our producers as well as some customers that – the lockable story was something that really resonated with a lot of people. And the fact that, you know, the lock is really kind of that safety net or it kind of allows that peace of mind. Uh, so just to give you an example, um, you know, the way the lock works is that you have the ability to go in and look at any given day to see, OK, if my policy anniversary was in January, here I am sitting in April, May or June, I can actually go on to the Allianz website and see Here's where my indexes are today. Maybe I'm at 12%, maybe I'm at 10%, 8%, whatever that number is. And you can actually lock that in if you're satisfied with what that return is. Now, does that mean that that index, if you lock in at say a 10 or a 12, if that index goes up to 15 or 16, will you still get that 10 or 12? Uh, but if that index suddenly goes down to seven or eight by the end of the year, you still get that 10 or 12. So taking advantage of that lock feature was very central uh, to these diversification strategies. Having said that, we also kind of said, you know, chasing one lockable option versus another gets back into that whole challenge of, of uh, just picking the index from year to year. So we really wanted to make it simple. We came up with six different options and we really separate them uh, based off of the bonus and or the fixed account. And so the first three are very simple. Uh, they're called the conservative strategy, the moderate strategy, and the aggressive strategy. All of them are the same in that we take 25%, put it in the Budby index, the PIMCO index, the blended futures, and the S&P futures. And then what makes a conservative, moderate, aggressive is which bonus you decide to attach to them. So again, the conservative is the most conservative option, which is the classic fixed bonus. That's the 1% bonus that you're going to get year after year, even if the market returns zero, you still get that bonus. That's the conservative one. The moderate one is that 15% multiplier. So whatever the credit is, you multiply it times 15%. Key thing to note there is that unlike the conservative strategy where you get a zero, 
the 1% would still get you one. On the moderate strategy, because it's a multiplier, that 15% of zero is still zero. Or well, that multiplier really starts to add up once you start getting some of these returns north of 9, 10, 11, 12%, that 15% really starts to be a pretty good size number. And then our most aggressive strategy uh, is what we call the select indexes. That's where it comes with a 40% multiplier, but instead wow. of getting a 0% return, you actually go backwards a little bit because it has a 1% asset charge. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, picking the best performing indexes to take advantage of a lot of those 15, 20, 25, and even a couple 30% returns, I can tell you all those major you know, hit home runs, so to speak, were those in the aggressive strategy. So again, that 40% multiplier really, really adds up. But the challenge and what makes it aggressive is that when you get a 0% year, which let's face it, about every fourth year or three times in the last 12, um, that's going to be the case. You're actually losing 1%. So again, taking all of that information was what came up with the conservative, the moderate, and the aggressive. That's great. We didn't stop so there. what you didn't stop there? Yeah, we didn't stop there because there's okay. also the fixed account. And we talked about okay. the 5.3% rate. And the reality is, is that even getting a 1% in a year when the index returns zero, um, that's not enough for some people. And some people really kind of want a higher floor. Well, the fixed account at 5.3%, again, when you're getting that zero, um, mix in the fixed account at even 20% of an allocation, you're actually getting up to almost a 2% floor. And so the reason mm -hmm. that we took those conservative, moderate, and aggressive strategies, we then took those same designs and threw the fixed account in for 20%. So it's now those four indexes at 20% and the fixed account for 20. And again, now you've built yourself basically uh, a 2% floor um, or, or a much better downside protection in some of those lean years, uh, which are going to happen. So again, those are the six strategies and all of our illustration systems. You can simply go in and click them. Um, you don't have to play with the percentages. We've pre-done all the work for you. I love it. It's uh, it's uh, it's it sounds it sounds very very fascinating and also very simple. I mean, for those for those of you out there that have not used IUL in the past, uh, I know some people I've talked to, some advisors I've spoken with, they're they're worried about it. It's too complicated, too many moving parts, too many selections to make. I think what you've done at Allianz is you've really taken all of that confusion out. You made it very simple and you've put it into three buckets that can really, an advisor can match that up with the with the client's risk profile and and really what they're what they're tolerant of, of taking. Uh, so I, I applaud Allianz for taking the step to do that. Absolutely. Well, and Corey, this has been a fantastic discussion. We went through a lot of information today. Clearly, there's an opportunity in this market. I'm going to give you a moment to catch your breath, and I'm going to remind viewers of what our resources are at DBS and how to help them understand really what we talked about. So I think the first line of defense, if you have questions about what you heard today, this is a this is a map of all of our case design analysts, and we have a number of them all throughout the country. Make sure that you reach out to your CDA, and they'll walk you through helping to understand really the Allianz suite and how the product that uh, they are just launching now is really going to be able to work with your client. The other individual I want to point out, because uh, we see Allianz being used more and more in advanced market strategies, is Terry Gatman. Terry Gatman, again, uh, heads up our advanced markets team here at DBS, and she'll be happy to talk to you about strategies that you can use to help leverage the Allianz Accumulator product. All right, let's go back to Corey real quick and get some final words. Corey, thanks again for joining me today. Absolutely, Kurt. I, I can't say enough that you know we value the relationship with all of you and kind of helping advocate uh, for our product out there. Uh, the one thing I would say, just kind of a parting thought, is we really tried with this product uh, to take advantage of all of the bells and whistles that make Allianz unique, taking advantage of our dynamic hedging platform, taking advantage of our company strength, taking advantage of just some of the innovation that we have in driving the industry. But at the same time, trying to keep it simple and trying to, you know, just be, be uh, the understanding of some of the challenges and some of these indexes and just the market environment that we've gone through over the last two to three years. And so the the feedback has been largely positive. Um, we're very excited about it. And uh, again, we'd, we'd certainly love to try and earn your business. So again, thank you for the time today and uh, happy to uh, chat anytime you'd like.
Well, Corey, thanks again for joining us. We loved having you with us today. And thank you to each one of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for another edition of Insurance Insight. Until next time, we look forward to seeing you here again real soon. Be well, take care, and stay safe, everyone. Thank you.